just waiting for the <laughs> the settling. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Everybody can hear me, good. So I'm not going to solve your JavaScript problems um, unless you have this one specific problem which I find uh, afflicts agencies. So um, what I'm talking about here is sort of the application of the keep it simple, stupid uh, principle where stupid sort of applies to me. Um, oh. Ha ha, I know my keyboard shortcuts don't work. <laughs> I'm at the end. One moment. All righty. So, my name is Christopher, um, and these links contain the repo that I refer to in this talk. My, uh, sorry, these are just my contact links, but the Mastodon link at the bottom contains links to uh, this this session on the DDD website, to the repo that I'll be talking about, to the demo site that I'll be talking about, and to these slides as well. So I can bring this back up at the end if you like. Uh, I work for these guys, uh, Anertech. They're at anertech.com. Mostly a full service agency. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, government and industry and a lot of uh, in-between things. Um, lately, Anertech's been doing a lot of work on local GovDrupal sites, so anybody from the UK may know what that's about. Local council, local city government sites and the Drupal sort of distribution that's built to do that. And again, they're at anertech.com. And I'll just move straight on. I have quite a few slides. Don't You don't have to follow the code. I'm gonna show you a lot of bits of code. You don't have to follow it uh, because the repo is available for later if you want. And each step that I take has a tag in the repo so you can go and see exactly the code that I'm talking about. So to begin with, um, what I'm talking about are just these little um, bits of interactivity on websites that we build time and time again. How many people here are sick of building accordions? OK, good. <laughs> so me too. And what, happen, what I find happens a lot in agency work is that the project is imperative and nobody wants to take time to um, reuse something from the past or if you do it's in a sloppy way where you just copy the code over and so no bug fixes or changes or improvements that happen to project A where you got the code from ever make it back to project B uh, or C or D or what have you and so we started looking to 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 solve this problem, partly because we had a lot of retrofitting to do for upcoming sort of accessibility changes in law, changes in law regarding accessibility. So there's lots of these things out in the world, some that we built, others that clients come to us with already, that just don't meet that requirement. And we sort of decided to, or I decided to formulate these kind of three questions uh, the first of which is the functionality. So what what are we trying to do in any given case? Um, and if you break it down, what you find, what we find is you do a lot of Booleans. So either you're setting true false values uh, or you're, you're checking the state of a thing to see if something is true or not. And not a lot else that's really important. After functionality, of course, is the accessibility. Thing. And by the way, the functionality thing is something we usually get mostly right, at least in, ter in terms of the thing working. So you tap on a heading in an accordion, one pane opens up, maybe the others close, maybe they don't. 
Um, but for accessibility, we want to be able to ensure access. And again, there is kind of a simple answer to how we do that. Uh, and, oh, ah, my slides. The answer is basically HTML. And if you look in my repo, you'll see me saying progressive enhancement. But that's actually not what I was talking about. I really meant to be talking about graceful degradation instead. Um, the difference isn't huge, but I'm talking about just make something that will work well even if JavaScript isn't present at all. Uh, and then the other part after that is following sort of the WAI area guidelines. So making sure that the markup um, reflects the interactivity that you're trying to make uh, correctly reflects it so that uh, assistive devices can interpret it properly. And then finally, this is the big one because I'm tired of building the same thing over and over again, is reusability. And I want to, the question we ask is how do we keep it, um, how do we keep it usable? How do we make sure that having used a thing on one project, we can then use it on the next project without having to rewrite it? And for that, um, maybe this is a bit dated. Uh, it's not me that has no strong feelings one way or the other, because uh, I have actually quite a lot of strong feelings about it, but the code should have no strong feelings. We want to write something that does the minimal amount of stuff so that we can um, just reuse it in different in contexts that differ from the um, the context for which it was originally written. Um, and to do that, you have to sort of anticipate kind of just how how it might be required to use in in, in other places. And so, to take you through bits of code for this, I'm going to use the the simplest possible form of these interactives, which is a disclosure, which is just a thing that opens and, a, and, and then closes again. So it's really the light switch of JavaScript, right? Just that. Uh, and the reason for that, one is because it's simple, but two is the this thing actually lives in the heart of a lot of the other ones. So if you consider it, an accordion is really a bunch of these stacked on each other with a little bit of intelligence maybe about how to how when one opens, the others stacked with it close. Um, likewise, uh, a set of tabs isn't that different. Um, you, the markup would differ, but the JavaScript actually could be very, very similar. So again, wrong label. Uh, when I say this, just mean graceful degradation. Graceful degradation is what I mean. So we start with a thing like this to get that disclosure. It's just a paragraph. And then with the application of JavaScript again, we can make that. And so to gracefully uh, degrade, what we would want to do is make sure that it just works as in the first case where no JavaScript is present. And that's what's happening in this slide. The first one doesn't have the JavaScript applied to it and the second one does. And we get there by having the right markup. And again, the right markup is a paragraph. It's nothing else to it. But of course, you have to actuate the paragraph to uh, open and close that thing. So maybe what we'll do is this. And we can do this either straight out of a template, like a twig template or whatever else. Uh, or we could write it in with JavaScript if we felt like it. Uh, and what's important up there is that hidden attribute, which will make sure that this thing isn't even displayed. It's essentially display none in, in the markup. And it's useful because it works, uh, provided you haven't messed with it, it works out of the box without any CSS applied to it. And so that means that the button itself, but even more importantly, the area attributes aren't in the sort of accessibility tree. So nobody's getting weird, strange messages about, about the fact that there's a push button on the page that can be actuated when it's not even displayed. Um, and again, if, if your JavaScript fails or is disabled or another script on the page breaks it or something, this helps a little bit to keep you from presenting something that's just sort of fundamentally broken. Um, this, this is just where I start, where I, 
where I've started to build these is just to use a class file. That's absolutely unimportant. Um, you can use a factory, you can use anything else that'll get you JavaScript that has functions. Again, uh, about the JavaScript itself, we're unopinionated in terms of how you like to build it. It's just what it does that's, that, that matters. Uh, so we, I'm just gonna start us like this, where we just we create something that exists, it doesn't do anything else. And something like this, which calls it. Um, my demo isn't in Drupal, so this isn't a Drupal behavior, but this is precisely the same as what would be inside a Drupal behavior if you're writing it. You query, you're probably using once in Drupal, to get the thing that you're looking for, which in this case is literally the button, because the button is what's crucial to this kind of thing. It, it, uh, we don't really care that much uh, at the beginning if there is something to open and close, because um, we can check for that elsewhere. And then once we have queried for the, tri for the trigger, for the button, we check to see if we got any, and if we don't, we just leave. But if we did, then we instantiate the class that we had. So the the thing that um, turned around our thinking, I think, um, with these kind of things is the idea that we should in essentially every case, anything we want to be reusable, should have an API of some kind so that it can be acted on from the outside. And for a thing like a disclosure, you might think, well, why, why? Like, why? It's a good question. And the reason is, um, one, because you don't know all the contexts. Again, this is, this is our goal, is to try and anticipate how the thing we make could be useful um, even in context, again, that we, we can't that we haven't anticipated yet. And there's one in particular uh, which relates back to the ARIA stuff in the markup. Uh, and that's making the actual JavaScript responsive. So in these kind of tools, again, they have these ARIA attributes. But if they're present in the markup, present or at least accessible via the accessibility tree, in the markup, when the thing isn't working, then you have a broken experience for somebody, probably for a lot of somebody's. Um, and so when there are things that we want to happen only, say, at a certain screen size, for example, um, the kind of menu kind of overlay that Occupies, occupies the entire screen of a mobile device and traps focus inside it so that you can't leave by accident. Um, that thing, maybe you're using the same markup on the mobile device and on desktops, but it doesn't happen, none of that happens on desktop because the menu is just always visible. In that case, we should be turning off all the JavaScript stuff that we did for mobile devices on um, uh, on desktop devices. And it's not necessarily enough just to hide the differences with CSS because you may still have these, these sort of area attributes and stuff in the markup um, and being sort of accessible in the tree and sending, you know, confusing messages. So again, for our disclosure, this is the first one there. I'm just gonna uh, just first outline what kind of an API we might wanna have like what kind of functions other scripts should be able to call. And then we'll fill them in a little bit as we go. So we want to enable it. That's just turn it on in the first place so that it can actually work. And then disable it, um, which is just the opposite. Again, booleans, opp opposing states. Where, of course, we're going to want to expand it. We're going to want to collapse it. We're going to want to check if it's enabled. And we're going to want to check if it's expanded. So this is a simple tool. This is all it does. These are, these are all the facts that you could sort of find out about it or the things that you can do with it, uh, with one exception, which isn't something that we have to implement as part of it because it's just part of JavaScript, but that is um, events. So oops, sorry. what we'd like to do is also 
um, emit an event, dispatch an event when we do something. So we'll fill this in, but for now, just know that we're going to create a special event for this. So we've got that, we've got that, um, the API. So we've got the four, four methods, enable, disable, expand, collapse, uh, and then the two just sort of informational ones, is expanded, is collapsed. So um, what we can do, again, these are simple, right? The, so the, the functions themselves should be simple. So I'm going to cheat and refer them off to another function. Um, likewise, disable, we started with just nothing. So we're going to send them off to one function that handles turning things on and off and uh, just depending on what value is passed to it, that'll determine what happens. So without an argument, we turn it on. With an argument set to false, we'll turn it off. With the expand and collapse, likewise. So the public API is just four lines of code, uh, six lines, because these just return properties of the object. Again, if you're using uh, something other than a class, it doesn't matter, just as long as the object that you instantiate has properties. And what this does is it sends all of the really sort of important stuff that we're going to do, the turning on, the turning off, the expanding, the collapsing, back into two functions, which are controlled just according to a simple Boolean. Uh, events are pretty simple. We just have to leverage JavaScript's ability to send, make custom events. The this dot name, in this case, I've opted to, in every, every time any of those four things happens, we're going to uh, send out an event called disclosure, and the action parameter here, or this detail parameter, will contain an information about what kind of thing just happened. Um, we could have also different events for everything that happens. This is a little tidier if you're coding like in a switch statement, you want to observe all the things that happen uh, and respond to them differently. But it's not really important as long as there's a way to determine what just happened. So coming to this, um, we're going to call the um, enable event just on an, an, an init function. So whenever this thing starts up, we'll call enable. And given what I said a few minutes ago, you might, you might think that that is leaving something out in your right, but we'll come back to it. But anyway, just the simple, see if we can get it started. If we can't, barf in the console. So to plumb those things out a little bit, we, this is the control function that was referred to, or the control method. And we're not, again, to start with, we don't have to do much. So when we're turning it on, we're going to make sure the button can respond to clicks, and we're going to make sure the button is visible. So line five, make sure we can respond to, to clicks. Line six, make sure it's visible. When we disable the other branch of the condition, we do the opposite. We remove the event listener. So um, essentially, no matter what happens when it's been disabled or it is disabled, um, it can't. Res nothing can respond to this click, and we set the trigger back to being hidden. Again, absent uh, messing around in CSS, hidden will make sure it's gone. And at every case, we're going to basically give the thing its default state. So if this, if that button, if you remember from way back already. It had an area expanded attribute, which is the one that matters for a thing like this. And it, w it could be set to false or true. And that just determines whether the thing is open or closed when you start it up. And the, the trigger will just sort of invert that state. So this, this is a way of uh, leaving something open when you want the user to be able to close it, or uh, having it start closed when you want them to be able to open it. So um, 
Once that's done, we can send out an event saying that we have enabled or disabled it. Oops, sorry. Um, line two, we've just we've defined that there. So yeah, so we can dispatch the event, and then we can set the property on the object, and this means that that function, part of the API, that is enabled function will return whatever this value was after this happens. So not too much to it. Again, just sort of inverting the state. And then coming back to this, um, you see I've introduced another method. So there's, there's another thing to do here. Uh, it's not part of the public API, but it's part of the, the sort of internal API. And with this, using the state of the object, we can just say what's going on, or we can, we can manipulate what's going on. So we will toggle, which is the next thing up, we'll toggle the state of the button to expand, like whatever it is, true or false. And that looks like this. Again, there's not really that much to it when it comes right down to it. So once again, we dispatch an event saying what's happened. We set the attribute. This is the only place other than that hidden attribute where you absolutely must do something in the DOM. Uh, and that's part of, part of keeping it generic, is not messing around a lot with the DOM. Um, it's very common for tools like this to use, to set all sorts of classes to, um, on the markup to say what's going on or what state it's in, but there's very little. This is literally all that's needed to even to do the CSS part, though we, there's one way that we want to improve on it, which we'll come to in a while. And again, once we've done it, we set the state on the object to, to whatever the value is, whether we were coming in to say, uh, open this or close it, expand it or collapse it. So already, um, already we're coming around to the minimum viable product, like a thing that will do the minimum light switch behavior. It'll open a thing, it'll close a thing. And I'm just going to walk through what that looks like from when you when you start when you instantiate the object on the page in a few in a few lines here. So. When it starts, oh, when it starts, we in, just initiate the thing. Just, this is just a, a function that the constructor calls just to get things going. And again, constructor, it's because I've used a class. Uh, there isn't any particular reason why you'd need to do that. There are many other ways that this would work just as well. But the init function then calls enable. And if you're following closely along, you'll realize that I should probably have just called the, called the internal function control here instead of using the public one. But that, uh, the control function is then called by enable or by disable, depending what happened at the, at the beginning. Those, that, that thing sets the event listener that can call or that can uh, listen for clicks on the button that, that will sort of cause the trigger, the cause the disclosure to open or close. And then there's the toggle button itself, which, uh, or the toggle method itself, which is called by all of, the, by all of these other methods on the, on the, in the object. And then the event that's called by, oops, sorry, the event that's called by control and toggle. So, Essentially, this is the internal API that corresponds to the external API. And it's control and toggle that are doing most of the work there. And they, again, they were, if the one was about eight lines, the other was six. They're, again, for a thing like this, it's not that complex. So we've got the progressive enhancement, which I keep calling the wrong thing, which is, um, 
uh, just to making sure it works with no JavaScript at all or if JavaScript fails. The content is there. The content is, imp more importantly, is styled, anticipating that JavaScript might not be present. We've got this in there, which again, in this case, is very simple. Um, in a, like a tabs or an accordion or a, like a slide deck like this, it would be, it, it's a fair amount more complicated. There's more than one. Uh, but here we've got, we've got our one and we've got a way to sort of toggle it back and forth. And we've got a way also to make sure that it's out of the accessibility tree when we don't want it to be or when it can't be. We've got our enable and disable. That's responsible for that part, for, for again, making sure that the parts of the markup that we want to be in the DOM uh, or accessible in the DOM are. We've got our expand and our collapse function. And we've got custom events. So that means we can do all the things that this thing can do in response to a button click. We can listen for when these things happen and um, decide what to do in other code on the page, other scripts on the page. But we don't have a few, few other things. So non-sibling elements. If anybody has surfed ahead and is looking at the demo site, the way this is working is it's finding the next sibling after the button and it's expanding and collapsing that. It doesn't care what it is, it'll just sort of, um, it'll just do that. And we do that just with a, um, an adjacency selector, so the plus in CSS. We just display it, button plus container and set it to display block or something. But there are cases where we don't wanna limit ourselves like that. Again, um, which I'll come to in just a moment. And another case, or in, in fact, an extension of the first case is when we want to, we might want to open multiple elements. Has anybody used um, local gov Drupal? Okay, so in the header, there's a thing that does this, uh, where you click one button and two things happen. Uh, it's actually not that unusual a thing to need. Um, but the way I've built this so far, that won't work. We can't do it. And then, as I referred to when I showed that init function, this manual enablement, so if we wanted to make the JavaScript itself responsive, as I mentioned, that won't work for what I've showed you so far. So now we need settings, and now we need another argument for the class. So this is what I was mentioning here. This is all that we're all that I've got it doing so far is anytime the area expanded element changes the next element, which is a paragraph in this case, just gets displayed blocker or none. Um, so if there was another paragraph after that that we also wanted to expand or collapse or another one somewhere else, won't work. So it's too opinionated. I've, I've said we should be generic, but um, this isn't generic, isn't sufficiently generic. So the non-sibling elements, so not just using the paragraph immediately after the button, and the multiple is actually the same problem, really. If you can use one somewhere else, maybe it's just nested in a div after the button or something, like your markup doesn't permit you to just sort of say, I want to only expand the thing that comes right after the button. That's a common situation. You don't want to re-architect a whole page sometimes when you're retrofitting something like this into um, replace something that wasn't doing its job quite as well. So now, again, if you're using a factory or something, or if you're using a class, we're just providing another argument. So we've got the trigger, which is the button. We've got the contents, which is the set of things that we're going to expand and collapse. And I'm hiding this one from you because it's the most complicated function in here, but it's actually not even that complicated. We just need to have something that will go and find out uh, from the contents argument what, th what things in the DOM we can operate on. And once that's done, 
uh, sorry, this, oh, it's probably a bit dim for the back, but this is the toggle method again, the actual open and closing method. And all we've done is add this loop. Well, so once we have a content thing, at least one, which might be the next adjacent element, but it might be something that you passed into the class, it'll set this new attribute, which is just a data attribute, on all of them. And now we can use that in CSS to sort of target um, whatever we need to. And again, uh, I didn't say this explicitly, but the idea here is that everything controlling the display of the contents itself is going to happen in CSS. Don't do any of it in JavaScript as if you, or you shouldn't do any of it in JavaScript if you ask me. Um, you can argue with me about that later if you like. Um, sorry. Just to say that that sol solves the two problems of being able to use things that aren't right next to your button in the markup and also of trying to use several things that are or are not right next to your button in the markup. Um, just by setting that data attribute on each one. And if you're not doing, you know, 200 different things, which will be impossible to manage anyway, um, it's not going to be slow or anything. If there's one or two items, the loop will take mill milliseconds or less. So finally, uh, we've got, we want to manually run the enable method. So again, if we would like to make this thing responsive. And so in the function, we're just going to start with some defaults. Or in the, sorry, in the class, we'll start with some defaults. But in the construction, in the constructor rather, we'll accept this settings argument over on the right. And then we just sort of merge them. So you can override whatever the defaults are. This is simple-minded. It's not, it won't do a proper deep clone if you're, uh, if you're worried about that, but for a simple set of keys and values, it works fine. And then we can check to see if we've been asked to start it. And if so, then we can run that enable function. And really, that's it. But there, I just wanted to show you from the demo site, if I can, um, sort of the what I promised, which was that uh, this would be better f or would be usable to do other things. Um, haha, and I can't remember how to do that on Chrome. One moment. There we go. So, you all aren't afraid of the ins inspector, I don't suppose. So this is the demo. This is, again, this is on Git GitHub pages if you want to look at it later. Um, but we have the basic disclosure here. And these, all these are just, um, they're, again, they're running on the, the sort of demo code but with a relatively little, so hang on, I'll back up one step. How many people have written a thing like a, a mobile nav that sort of covers the whole screen, traps focus inside it so you can't get out of it, and found it a terrible pain? Yeah, okay, it's more than one. So this thing does a fairly, if I could click it, yeah, good, thank you. This does a fairly good job of that, and that's using the same disclosure, just wrapped in some other code. Um, but it's wrapped in the code that makes it responsive. So on, if you either start out on desktop, uh, or you move from mobile to desktop size, um, it'll either not be present in the first place, or it'll remove itself um, uh, if you move over to a desktop size. And we've also found that just the basic disclosure works really great for making a mega menu. Like, so if you just have like sort of a row of buttons, oop, my timer too. If you just have a row of buttons, each of which launches a big hunk of content or displays a big hunk of content, uh, it works well for that too. Uh, so you can actually really use, um, and sorry, and the reason it works well like that is because you can 
how you can write just a, a relatively small little wrapper that sort of supervises a bunch of these little things um, and lets you just sort of use them all as one. Uh, same is true with accordions, actually. I'm not saying you should do that in every case or even in many cases, but it actually is a thing you can do. It actually winds, just by having the ways of interacting with it from outside, it actually winds up being quite, um, quite uh, flexible. And that's about all I've got. I'll bring us back to the links pages. There we go. So that's it. Um, are there questions? Oh, <laughs> there are AV questions. Thank you. Um, you you said that you can use this through other projects, mm -hmm. but I don't think you touched that point. How would you reuse it in another project? How would you have this code used by many projects? Oh, so. What we do internally is we we set the everybody heard the question because it's on the mic, right? Yeah. What we do internally is we set up an uh, an npm package registry on our private GitLab, and because this is no dependency, what we have been evolving towards I don't know if this is our permanent solution, but is to use the um, post install hook in npm to just sort of copy it into the project. So that gets us, we, we have a copy of it in the project's repository, but it also means we can still rely on NPM if versions change, if we want to update it or something. And so in Drupal, once that's there, then it can be a library, and that library can be a dependency on, on the, of course, of course. or of, the, uh, of a Drupal behavior, for example. Okay, and then to expand on this idea, why would each agency has its own well, no, that's a great question, yeah. <laughs> we just, uh, for us, we haven't had any uh, really thoughts about um, making it public until we, at least until we figured out that we're doing it right. Um, one of the reasons, though, that we did start doing this is because we didn't find this existing already. The, especially on the accessibility part, we found a lot of sort of deficiencies in things like, um, again, I don't claim it's perfect, but that uh, mobile nav that I just showed you does deal with a problem of being able to escape the focus trap in a screen reader. Like so where, you know, it's covering the whole screen. You shouldn't be able to access a link or a button that's behind it, right? But with a screen reader, we found you actually could. And there's some question about whether on a screen reader that's okay, but we found a way that we could work around it. And we found that other solutions claiming to solve that problem didn't. More? Others? Uh, thank you uh, for the w when you were setting the attribute to hide the content the actual contents uh, is there a specific reason why you opted for uh, setting a custom data attribute instead of uh, making it uh, uh, and for example or using a CSS class since you only use it to add CSS is there a reason behind that no, no, no special reason. Uh, mainly, I, we used a data attribute just to indicate that it was simply something functional. Um, so it it leaves um, it kind of the idea is kind of that it won't touch anything that's already there. So there's, if there's already a bunch of classes on a thing, we don't need to add more necessarily. And it's useful enough in combination with other selectors. Um, or on or on its own, but yeah, no special reason. Any others? Alrighty. 
If anybody wants to argue, you can find me around. 